The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus saw the crowd, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, the creator, liberator, and sustainer of the universe. Amen. Today we celebrate the glorious feast of All Saints Day. All Saints is perhaps the most beloved feast in the Anglican Communion, and certainly the hymns we sing on this day are some of the ones that we love the most. There were two major elements that are central to the Feast of All Saints, I believe, to which I want to call your attention today in this sermon. The first is that All Saints calls us to remember, calls us to remember who we are. When we are baptized into Christ, we become a member of the great company of saints, the communion of saints. It calls us to remember that we are saints and part of the communion of saints, which means that it calls us to remember that we are not everything that there is. Secondly, I believe that this day calls us to look very clearly at where we are headed as the people of God. It calls us to look to our future because where we are headed has radical implications for the way we live today. And as the revelation to John points out very clearly, our journey is to a new world. We are moving toward the reign of God which means that for us, the most important values that guide our lives today are kingdom of God values. It was in 1832 when the great American Henry Clay coined the phrase, self-made man. That phrase caught on like wildfire in our culture and has become almost a watchword for our culture. We like to think of ourselves as self-made people. We even boast at times, no one ever helped me along the way. I made it all by myself. This day, points to the reality that that is a deception. 
It is not only a deception, it's what in theological terms we call a Christian heresy. None of us is self-made. None of us is self-made. We all depend upon the grace of God just to live. And we particularly depend upon the grace of God as it has been revealed in the saints. Today, as we remember who we are, saints and members of the communion of saints, today, as we remember that, we remember that we have all our lives been nurtured and sustained by others. Some of those others we remember are well known. On the Feast of All Saints, we, for example, remember major saints. Saint Mary, Saint Peter, Saint Paul, Saint George, Saint Teresa of Avila. But we also remember those saints who are not so well known. We remember those saints who have touched our lives in ways that have transformed them. As a young boy, I used to spend the summers with my maternal grandfather in the mountains of Western North Carolina. He was a farmer, worked in a cotton mill also. But on Sunday, I would go to church with him. The only time I ever saw my grandfather cry was when they would sing hymns that talked about the crucifixion of Jesus. And sometimes I would look over the singing, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? And there would be a tear running down his face. I saw the great love that he had for Jesus. That had a profound influence on me. I remember my fourth grade Sunday school teacher, Miss James. Miss James, it seemed to me, lived just to let fourth graders know that they were the most important people in the whole world and that God loved you. And if you were in her class, God especially loved you. The love and concern that that woman had for fourth grade children left a mark on my life that I was loved by God because the love that Miss James had was so contagious. There were other things that I have learned. In 1963, I, I went into a, what was it called, an overseas training program you were going to be a missionary overseas, you had to be trained. I was still in seminary, and so I took this semester to go and work in Central America. And I went into this rather poor section of Costa Rica, the province of Limon was the poorest section in Costa Rica. Lived and worked in Puerto Limon, La Iglesia San Marcos, St. Mark's Church. Just to give you an illustration of that town, which had about 30 to 50,000 people in it at that time, 50% of the people were unemployed. The United Fruit Company had been there and had left, in part because of what was called a banana blight. I thought that town was really poor, but but the people used to tell me, said, you ought to experience the old line say, have you been to Guasimo yet? And I would always say, no, I have not been to Guasimo. It was 50 miles back in the jungle, and there was was still a banana train that went back there once a week. You have to go, they said. 
So finally, the priest I was working with said, next week, you are going to Guasimo. So Monday, I got up, caught the train at 4 o'clock in the morning or something like that. I was, I was the only passenger going to Guasimo. It was a rainy season, and, and I, I arrived there, and remember the train stopping, and I got off, and it was so muddy. I, I, I sunk down below, above my ankles in mud. Just, and, uh, this is, there was this priest waiting there for me, Father Harrison. Father Harrison was from Barbados. He had been educated in England and had been on his way back to Barbados after he was ordained priest. And he heard that there was this large communion, large company of West Indians who lived in Guasimo, Costa Rica. And they were almost all Anglicans coming out of the Church of England. So he decided to go visit them. So he gets to Guasimo and he finds that there's this Anglican church, Episcopal church, but they have no priest. And they say to him, God has sent you here, and you are to become our priest. Again, he was on his way home to Barbados, so he prayed about it, and people said, you have to stay. So he said that he would stay there in Guasimo until they got another priest. Well, he was there for the next 46 years. They never got another priest. And during his time, every year things just got worse. Economically, it was just devastating. People had almost nothing. Schools kept cutting back, no high school, no junior high. Finally, sixth grade was the highest educational level there. Father Harrison said all the smart people left by the time they were in the fourth grade. There were no roads that went to Guasimo, only the train that came once a week, brought the mail, stuff like that. Father Harrison was a very bright man. He, uh, before the electricity went off at night in Guasimo, and, it was all generated power, so at about seven or eight, you didn't have any electricity till the next morning. And, uh, but, but, but between like six and seven, every night, he would engage in this exercise, which fascinated me. He would take a newspaper, then Spanish, of course. He would translate it into English, translate the English into French, translate the French into Latin, then translate it back into Spanish, and compare it with the Spanish edition that he had started with. I was amazed at his linguistic skills, and he found that the most entertaining thing there was to do in Guasimo. And he was probably, probably right. He ministered to those people for 46 years. I remember when I left Guasimo, I was so glad to get out of there. I thought to myself, you know, every night there were just mosquitoes, there were, you name it, in Guasimo, that's what it was. Everyone was sort of down, they wanted to get out, didn't want to stay there, the people had lost jobs, almost no one had jobs. It was a really tough place, and you knew that it was just going to get worse and worse. I mean, the membership in the church just kept going down and down and down because people were leaving. I've never forgotten the commitment that Father Harrison had. I never, I've never forgotten that when we speak today in the church of a preferential option for the poor, the option that Father Harrison made, I never forget that this scholarly man was willing to live among these poor, oppressed, 46 years, almost no recognition of his ministry, you know. He stayed, and he stayed, and he stayed, because he had made a commitment that he would be there with them. I was working in 
Richmond, Virginia, I had just gotten out of seminary, and <laughs> I had been deeply involved in the civil rights movement with another seminarian who was a couple of years behind me named Jonathan Daniels. Jonathan and I had both worked in the Deep South, primarily for the Episcopal Society for Cultural and Racial Unity. And on, on the 16th of August, 1965, Jonathan was arrested, along with some other people in Haynesville, Alabama. They had been working, registering black people to vote in the state of Alabama. And so they went to jail on the 14th of August. On the 20th of August, they were all of a sudden released for no reason. They just, the sheriff came and opened the cell and told them to get out. So they go out of the jail and they, they, they're not sure what they're gonna do next, but they walk and they see there's a store right across the street. And so they decide they're gonna get something to drink and, and they start walking across the street. As they walk up the steps to the, to the, to the store, the door opens and a deputy sheriff steps out with a shotgun and takes an aim right at a young woman named Ruby Sales, a young black woman who was standing beside Jonathan. Jonathan stepped in front of her and took the shot. And in that moment was washed in the blood of the lamb. He became a martyr and he died. I remember getting the news. I was working in also in a very tough situation in Virginia. I really wasn't sure what to do. I, 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 I just couldn't believe that he had been shot and killed, but he had. There has not been a day in my life since then that in one way or another, I have not thought of Jonathan. I have never been able to live my life as if what happened to him didn't happen. He has sustained me in more situations than you can believe. And I believe that in my own life, as I journey on, as do you, that you are surrounded by those members of your family, by those Sunday school teachers, by those people who have proved to be witnesses to the transforming power of God in human history. We are reminded today that we are saints and we are called to be saints. And we are reminded today that as we journey, we do not journey alone that we are surrounded by those who have gone before us, both on earth, both in heaven, and also those who are with us now. And lastly, the book of Revelation calls us to be very clear about where we are headed Our epistle this morning from 1 John 3 reminds us that we are moving into Christ. We are becoming as Christ is. And we know that since the resurrection of Christ, we have had the beginning of the coming reign of God. That new age, that new world toward which we are all moving. And the book of Revelation is very, very clear about what that, in part, looks like.
John, who is in exile, being he's in exile by the Roman emperor from Patmos, it's very clear that the kingdom is composed of people from all nations, tribes, tongues. John wants us to know that we had better have pretty strong multicultural values if we are going to be at home in the new world. There is no holy race. There is no holy language. There is the one holy people of God. And those people speak many languages, belong to many nations, come out of many different tribes, and we need to be creating a world in which that reality is celebrated. Because if we don't, we're going to be very uncomfortable when we get to heaven. Secondly, John calls us to speak the truth. And for John, it meant that he had to bear witness that Jesus was Lord and not the Roman emperor. That's why he was on Patmos. So we have to be clear. We have to be clear and be witness to truth. Speak the truth. Be the truth. And lastly, John says that in the new age, in the new Jerusalem, all tears shall be wiped away. The suffering will know joy, which means, among other things, that we all had better be involved in wiping away tears right now. Because it would be an awful thing to stand before the crucified Lord on Judgment Day with no tear stains on your clothing because you had never wiped any away. And we should be involved in the process of, alle of alleviating as much suffering as possible in the world in which we live. All Saints Day calls us to realize that we are saints, that we are surrounded by a great company of saints. But it also calls us to be sure that we become who we are and that our primary values are those values of the reign of God. Let there be peace among us, and let us never be instruments of our own or anyone else's oppression. Amen.